The following program is brought to you by Fan Bags Cornhole, Chicago's official supplier of professional cornhole boards and bags. Choose from any of their officially licensed designs or have my boy Brian design a custom set using anything from a selfie to your company's logo. Visit www.fanbagscornhole.com and use the promo code BRAGS to get 10% off your entire order. That's www.fanbagscornhole.com and use promo code BRAGS for 10% off. Step up your game with Fan Bags Cornhole. It's Zach Eady with Purdue Men's Basketball, and you're watching Boilers in the Stands. Welcome back to Boilers in the Stands. I am your host, Joe Jackson. Joining me is Craig Bowers, and we are here going to just do a somewhat quick preview of the Tennessee-Purdue Elite Eight game. Obviously, that is tomorrow. We got the tip time. It is 2.20 Eastern time, so um, if you are not able to make it, we, you know that's the time it'll start on TV. But we do hope to see a lot of you there. It was a lot of Purdue fans. Tennessee fans also do travel well. Um, it should be a very, very good environment if you are able to make it up to Detroit. So with this preview show, um, we were like, well, we want to keep this kind of short. So we were just like, Braggs, you you can't come on. Um, so we're going <laughs> to we're going we're gonna to get into it right here. Just go over some of the, the key things. I'll throw it to you, Craig. Um, any new thoughts from either just last night's game, Tennessee, just big picture stuff that you want to throw out? I just, actually, we haven't been able to find Greg. We lost him at some point last night. He's not returning <laughs> phone calls. We 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 hope he's okay. Uh, not sure where he's located in Detroit. Um, hopefully, if you see Greg, if you spot Greg out there, uh, please let us know. Um, you know, I, I don't know. Like like you, um, we've been digging back through the Purdue Tennessee game earlier this year. We've been watching Tennessee as they've progressed throughout the season, and I. You know, it's kind of funny to me because as we watched the Gonzaga game, trying to think about what that might be, there were lots of things that had changed for Gonzaga coming into that game. And we thought, well, this may happen, that may happen. Rewatching that Tennessee game and seeing Tennessee play uh, multiple times throughout the season, I don't know that that much has changed in, in terms of who Tennessee is or what this matchup may look like and what it may be. There's little things. Obviously, Ziegler, that was his first game back from injury. So he's healthier now. He did play quite a few minutes in that game, but he's healthier. Uh, definitely looks more like the, the old Ziegler that people yeah. knew in terms of the quickness to his step and all of that. So that definitely has the potential to change the game some, but I think in a lot of ways, it's, it's going to be pretty similar. Um, I'm hoping that Tennessee chooses not to, um, not to foul Zach as much as they did the last time around. Um, I'm hoping it's a little bit cleaner game or maybe the whistle's just a little bit different. But if they're fouls, they got to call them. They got to call them, you know. So, um, but I think it's going to be pretty similar just in terms of the, the way the two teams try to attack each other. Yeah. And Tennessee is a team that fouls a lot. We already know that Purdue draws a ton of fouls. I would expect that to happen. The thing that probably gets lost a little bit in that first game discourse is that like Tennessee took 30 free throws also. Mm -hmm. And up until when Tennessee started intentionally following, like it was 42 to 30 in terms of free throws. Like, and I understand that's going to be a huge talking point with fans and all that. Um, like Purdue, Edie was in foul trouble. Gills was in foul trouble. TKR was in foul trouble. I think brain got into a, a little bit of foul trouble. Um, or no, he did not, but uh, somebody else did. Mason, I don't know who else did, but whatever. A lot of Purdue guys did get into foul trouble too. Um, and so that'll be something is just like, Hey, you gotta like Edie has to stay out of foul trouble. I, I think, a couple of calls were questionable, but at the end of the day, that's that's how whistles go, right? Sometimes it's going to go for you. Sometimes it's going to go against you. Um, I agree with your kind of comments of like 
Tennessee is is um, still pretty similar to what they are they were then. Uh, like you said, Ziegler is much much um, much just healthier at this point now, and he's he's playing his full set of minutes, and he has been very good recently. So that's the big thing. There's also um, I would I mean I have no insight. I've just purely guessing. Vescovy didn't play against Crane yesterday. Um, he was had the flu. If it's the flu, I would guess he would try to give it a go against Purdue. But obviously, I don't you know I don't know the extents or anything like that. So that'll be something to watch too. Is that's their their main uh, like shooting guard type player. Um, for me, it's just as as I kind of watched back through um, and did like some film on Tennessee's. Like the biggest thing that stands out is just like. Tennessee does a great job of forcing contested threes. Purdue does a great job of getting open threes. And so just the, the stylistic matchup of like Tennessee is going to close out hard and they, they force a ton of contested threes. But we know that Purdue, especially with Edie, um, just creates so much space and, and get these open threes. So that's going to be something I, that's going to be one of the bigger things I'll be I'm going to be looking for is just like what time type of perimeter shots is Purdue getting? Because Tennessee yeah, no. allows a lot of threes. They're just a lot of contested ones. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. And I think one of the other things that, that gets lost on that game um, around the free throw shooting in that initial game is that was Purdue's fifth worst shooting night from the free throw line on the entire season. Um, if Purdue shoots around their average, that's a 12-point victory that night. Uh, Purdue scores over 80. Um, if they just you know knock down another 10 15% of the free throws with the amount – that they had, obviously. But yeah, I, I think from an open three standpoint, I guess one of the things rewatching that game was I thought, you know, Tennessee doesn't, like you said, doesn't truly double the post, but their guards dig down. Mm -hmm. And they usually did it after Zach put the ball on the floor and would start to go into his move. Um, I thought there was some times that Zach forced the issue in that game instead of making the quick read and kicking it out. And I think... I'm hoping as the, as the season goes on, we've seen him uh, make that read, make that quick kick out much more often than not when he gets that second guy on him. So, uh, you know, hoping that he makes that read and doesn't have very many turnovers and get that kick out. And I think that gets us more open threes and gets us more open looks in general. And, and Purdue's proven that if they get open looks, they're going to knock him down. I think yep. one of the other things to me in general, and we've talked about this before, but when you play a team that plays that super aggressive style of defense that wants to put a ton of on-ball pressure on you, I always think matching uh, aggression and mass matching physicality is extremely important. I thought Fletcher did an excellent job of that in that first matchup. Um, and I'm not talking necessarily even about getting all the way to the rim, but when you got a guard that's trying to get up in you and get really physical – if you're aggressive in terms of, of off the bounce and can create some contact, you put the onus on the official to then have to make a call. And more times than not, when Fletch did that or other guards did that, you know, Tennessee wasn't really in a legal guarding position. If you create a little contact, get a foul, start getting to the foul line, start getting some easy buckets. So <coughs> I, I always think that's important just in terms of matching physicality and then using a little bit of aggression to counter their aggression and get to the line and get some people in foul trouble. Yeah, and if Purdue can do that, that's going to bode well for them. They obviously did that the first game around, and that was the like when you think of the Fletcher Lawyer big game, big game Fletch, like that's that's the game that pops into your mind from this season. Um, wouldn't be mad if he wanted to replicate it. Uh, I, I wouldn't be mad about that whatsoever. Um, but yeah, no, I, this is going to be a physical game. Most games are with Purdue. That's just how it goes. But even this one more so than than in general. Um, Purdue has to be able to, you know, like you said, match the physicality, but also like stay under control and so right. i think you see sometimes where it's just like it's, and, and i understand that it's tough right they're getting beat up Edie's getting beat up down low um and just you can't you can't have any like kind of that silly retaliation file type stuff um and, and i think Edie's pretty good about that for the most part but an elite eight game against a good tennessee team a great tennessee team like you just you can't afford that stuff um because then when we go to the foul trouble, and I'm going to bring it back to the three-point shooting a little bit, is Mason Gillis played 12 minutes that game. Mm -hmm. And when we talk about space, like, right, Edie needs Edie needs some space to work down low. He didn't play many minutes with Gillis. It was with TKR and first, and just like that makes it even that much easier for Tennessee to show that help in the paint. Um, and so Gillis is another guy that probably just kind of has to stay out of foul trouble and be able to be on the floor because I think his three point <laughs> shooting and also his ability to still be physical, right? He's what well, he's only six, six, but he's very, I mean, 
he might be like the strongest dude on the team for like his size, you know, um, mm-hmm. and, and he can match that physicality, like you said. So he's going to be important, I think, of just like being able to stay on the floor. TKR has had his moments, which has been good. Um, I know first is kind of falling out the rotation, but Gills will be somebody else. I'm, I'm going to be kind of keying in on for this game. Yeah, no doubt. Um, I, <sighs> And I obviously I think Gillis is extremely important uh, from an offensive spacing standpoint. Uh, also, just I think both both of those guys um, do a nice job of getting on the boards. Um, mm-hmm. But I think cleaning up the glass is going to be important tonight too. But I'm really interested to see, you know, for, for Purdue rotationally back then, first and Morton were getting a lot of minutes and. Um, you know, back in that tournament, Morton was huge in the Gonzaga game specifically in terms of helping to, to slow down uh, Nemhard in that first matchup. But in this game, uh, I think Morton came in and gave some minutes against Connect, if I remember right. Yep. Um, I'm curious to see who gets that matchup. I, I mean, I know from the starting lineup who I think is going to get that matchup, but as the game progresses, if Connect is going off, and Purdue really did a great job of not letting him go off. Uh, and when he would try to drive, he kind of gets in a black hole zone and, and frame of mind when he drives. Like when he drives, he's shooting the ball. That ball's not coming out. Yep. And he commits to it. And Purdue did a really nice job. The guards did that were off kind of digging down and, and just getting their hand in there. And I think they forced three or four turnovers on him to the point in the second half uh, where Barnes actually sat him down for a few minutes because he had a few couple turnovers in a row and I think maybe an offensive foul or something like that. But I think that's going to be important just for other people to help. Um, but also I'm curious to see if Cam gets more of that assignment um, because we've seen even, even in rematches where Morton did a really good job defensively the first time around, Cam's kind of gotten those minutes um, this second time around. And I, I kn- we didn't really talk about it last night, but Cam played some really good minutes on Nimhard last night mm-hmm. um, when Lance went out for a little stretch, just in a little stretch where his size and his length bothered him a bunch. But so that that's going to interest me a lot, just who gets that matchup, um, specifically when it's not the starting lineup and, and how they handle it and if we can, can he- keep Connect bottled up. But I think Purdue does a really nice job, Painter does, when when a team has somebody that we can kind of – lose and just forget about <laughs> um purdue painter does a really nice job of de- designing the defense and i guess i should say johnson does a really nice job of designing that defense and just kind of not completely forgetting about that fifth man but if there's a non-shooter out there playing off of him and doing a really nice job to, to do things to stop the other four i think tennessee presents that type of situation mostly um where purdue can just kind of hone in on the guys that are actual impact scorers and forget about some of the people out there on the court yeah that was one of the things i noticed too it's just like tennessee's not going to be able to put out a five shooter lineup or and there's only really there's one combo that they could do it if they like really wanted to and if they do then their tallest guy is six seven josiah jordan james um and then obviously that's going to be interesting matchups on the other ends but yeah ed's going to kind of just do the one-man zone adu is not like you know um, like, like Adu is still solid. It's not like he he can't score the ball or anything like that. But it's a lot of dump offs. It's a lot of little floaters. A lot. Of, I mean, similar stuff to kind of what Gonzaga did. And so you're going to see Edie just help on those drives, like you said. And, and if Connect does is getting by Jones or, or Heidi, which I do assume Heidi is going to be the one that is going to come in and, and take Connect. Like I assume he still gets the minutes over Morton, especially just with. I mean, we already talked about the spacing that that Purdue needs. Um, it, it's just hard to get that with Morton right now. So, yeah, I know I agree with that with Edie. Um, we've gone 14, 15 minutes, and we haven't talked about turnovers. It just feels like yeah. we have to, right? And so transitioning to kind of the guards of of how this is – I mean, Brain Smith just came off one of his best performances of the season. Like, maybe his best. I don't know. I, my, it might be his best. Um, they had 16 turnovers in that first the first matchup. Uh, Jones had four. Smith had three. Lawyer had two. Uh, Gill said two, and then a whole bunch of people had one. Tennessee, in, in their pick and roll coverage, they're going to hedge. And so I, I, I'll just explain it real quick for anybody that, that doesn't know. is just that big. I guess I have my board. I could. Let's it. do but, it, Joe. Bring out the board. 
Hey, in the meantime, Greg checked in and said at least somebody's working today. And then also contributed there that um, he's actually the one that suggested that we do this preview show. Uh, I'm not even sure that he talked with us about it yet ahead of time. And then he he just went golfing instead today. So, uh, but we we love you, Greg, and and you deserve it. You're hard working with all your Chicago stuff and with the Purdue stuff. Enjoy your time at Top Golf with your buddy. Yep, for sure. So. Oh, these reflections are crazy, but we're just going to have to roll with it because I'm in a hotel room and that's how this goes. Um, so, okay. So when I'm talking about the hedge, right, is, and this is a Purdue pick and roll right here. All right. And Brainsmith's going to have the ball. He's going to come off this big defending Edie. He's going to step out this way. And his whole go goal is to just force Brainsmith to go this way. Brains defender is going to come this way. Right. And so now you have two on the ball and Gillis usually is going to replace the role. And so he's going to be up here, his defender. And then you get into this. I mean, this is and this is exactly what Gonzaga did yesterday too. Um, now Tennessee is much better at it, but you get up here, and now you're going to have this, and then like Edie's rolling, and now you have this two-on-one defender here, right? And usually he's just going to rotate and tag. And what Tennessee does a great job of doing is if this right, if if they throw this kind of skip pass to a shooter, is they'll maybe sometimes have him close out and, and then keep a guy on Edie. Or even they'll have like this guy close out, the big get back to Edie, him rotate back. And they're just very, very timely with um, how they are able to rotate out of this hedge. And so, again, this hedge is, is the important thing in this. And so it's just one, like Brainsmith did a fantastic job against Gonzaga. And, and he's going to have to maybe not replicate that performance. I'm not expecting 15 assists again, but being able to take care of the ball and create out of that. Because if that's what's going to happen is that you're putting two defenders on one person. And so Brian Smith just has to be able to create, but with Tennessee being so good at, at and, and they're not like the most elite team at forcing turnovers, but they are very good at forcing turnovers. Passes have to be on point. You have to be able to get your angles um, and kind of your passing windows. Edie has to dive hard though. The wing guys, the shooters, Will, lawyer Gillis generally, uh, they have to get in spots where brain can find them. And, and so then it's just, and then it also comes back to like brain has to, uh, going back to the physicality is just like brain has to absorb it. Like the guards are going to be physical. These are very good defensive guards for Tennessee. And a lot of what Tennessee is able to do is because the guards are just going to kind of stay with their man and, and they get through screens. Well, um, so brain being able to kind of withstand that physicality and still make the reads is going to be big. If he can do that, that's going to open up the three point shots um, that we've been talking about. And then you just got to knock them down, which I mean, Purdue has done much, much more often than not so far. Yeah, no doubt. And I think to that <clears throat> turnover question, right? And and Painter said when they have 13 or less turnovers, they're like 26 and 0 this year. So I, obviously that's just really, really important always for Purdue. Um, I do think in that game, um, like some of it to me was just Lance had not been with Purdue and played with Purdue in high pressure situations a lot yep. at that point in time. Yeah, he he had a few turnovers in that game that I just don't think he makes anymore. Um, to be honest, I, I think he just plays under control a lot more now. I think he's much much better in terms of entry passes to Zach right now um, than he was back then. And I think quite several of those came uh, off the of entry more so than like steals up top on he, the perimeter. A lot of them came from uh, people trying to get the entry pass into Zach. Go ahead. Sorry to cut you off, and I'll throw it back. He had a post entry pass go off the backboard. Yeah, I remember. I saw that. I saw that. If you had more, yeah. though, go. No, I, I really don't have a lot more there. Um, do you do you have anything? I, Tennessee is really, really good defensively. Um, yeah. I, I Like you said, I, I think they're more to me a, of a team that's really good in the half court and putting ball pressure on, uh, but not necessarily, like you said, I, I don't think they're – they're a team that necessarily creates just an absolutely crazy high turnover rate. With that said, like there is a weak link on Tennessee's defense. Dalton Connect is an incredibly good offensive player, but my lord, he cannot play defense. When when we started that, me and you were watching the game apparently at the exact same time because we like text each other almost exactly and was like, "Lawyer is torch and connect to start that game." And he's doing it off the bounce, not like catch and shoot, head fake threes or anything. He was taking connect off the bounce um, and getting to the rim or getting to a little three footer. So I do think there's some opportunity there. Whoever connect is garden, whether that's Lance, whether that's Fletcher 
to maybe attack him a little bit. Um, because if there is a weak link on Tennessee's defense, it's definitely him. Yeah, I agree. And that's where, when I just talked about, right, Tennessee is very good on ball one-on-one. The guards are going to stay connected. Connect is the one guy where it seemed for large chunks of the year is the guy you can kind of get through. And so, I don't know, because he started on lawyer for that game. I wouldn't be, sh- I guess it's going to depend on what Vescovy, if Vescovy starts or not too, because um, who did they start in place of him yesterday? They started Meshack. So yeah, I could see Connect maybe going to Jones, and then they're going to throw Meshack on Lawyer, and just being like, you take the sporadic Jones, and you hope that he has one of those games that he misses. Um, but yeah, no, I agree that that is one of the spots where you can attack defensively and, and get downhill. Um, maybe force Tennessee into even some rotations that they're not used to, get some good looks out of that. So good call on that one. Um, take a very quick break because, like I said, we're not trying to go crazy long we're going to head over to presser um pretty quick to try to get some quotes up for you guys too just so before we do that um give a quick shout out to our sponsor autograph and and for anybody that doesn't know autograph is the app where you can get all your produced sports coverage in one spot you just go on it's completely free to use our podcasts you know all the kind of beat reporters that you you love and you follow um, and then even like bigger stuff, boiler ball tweets will show things like that. All that's just going to be in one specific spot. Um, and it's really cool. And then also obviously tons of other colleges pages that you could go to and get content for there. So use code bits. I'll throw up the QR code right now, scan this use code bits. It is completely free to use Apple and Android. Um, and then you can also get rewarded. So there's rewards for interacting. You can use these like coins to be entered into raffles or, um, there's even like draw, like, um, drawings for, very cheap tickets for March, like March madness games. There's different games throughout the season that they've done. So we do appreciate them working with us, sponsoring us use code bits, sign up completely free. Um, So, okay. I I think we could go another, I don't know, 15 minutes or so, something like that. Um, I'm trying to think what what, I'm trying to think of. There's like one more thing that I wanted to really talk about and, and now it's escaping my mind. So if you got something off the top of your head, go for it. And hopefully it comes back to me. Oh, I just, um, you know, as Purdue fans, we always talk about like that random dude going off because there always seems to be some random dude that goes off against Purdue. And in that game, Ganey gets like 15 points against us and he's averaging like six and a half or seven on the season and only shooting 28% from three. But I just don't know as I look at this game and Tennessee could definitely be Purdue. I, at this point, um, when you're this far into the tournament, anybody can beat anybody. It takes one bad shooting night. It takes one one day of somebody getting into foul trouble that shouldn't get into foul trouble. But when you just look at this matchup to me, and as I rewatched, even though I know it was a close game, but Purdue missed a bunch of free throws, and there were opportunities for some open threes if we kick out faster. There were some silly turnovers, that sort of stuff. I just don't know if Tennessee has the offensive firepower. If, if Purdue doesn't turn the ball over, mm-hmm. I don't know that Tennessee has the offensive firepower. Because even if Connect goes for 35, like... <laughs> I, I, that doesn't that doesn't worry me all that much. Like you want to slow connect down as much as possible, but man, there's just not a lot of off- offensive firepower on that Tennessee team. And if Purdue doesn't turn the ball over, I, I just don't know that they can they can match in terms of a scoring output is what Purdue can do. And that kind of relates. There is a, a comment from Midwest Toker. What about how we handle the fast pace of Tennessee? And a lot of their like a lot of their faster pace will be off of turnovers. And so, if you limit turnovers, you limit the opportunities for them uh, to do that. Now you allow your defense to get set up. You allow Edie to kind of one man zone near the rim. But in general, I mean, that's Purdue did it yesterday against Gonzaga. It's make or miss. You're going to have whoever's guarding the ball, right? It's going to be whoever's guarding Ziegler, which I assume is going to be Braden Smith um, for most of this game. He's just going to pick up full court and all that's trying to do. You're not trying to force a steal or anything like that. You're literally just trying to basically just make the guy take two more seconds to get the ball up the floor. Um, now that's going to require everybody to be on points. And luckily they have had practice against Gonzaga. I mean, they played Michigan state recently, or it feels forever ago at this point, but somewhat recently um, Michigan state is another team that does it. So they, they, they have this practice. They are able to do it 100%, but it's going to take, Smith, Heidi, if Jones is ever on Ziegler um, or whoever's kind of, you know, whoever's their backup point guard that they'll have in at the time, um, which I guess it's Meshack. I think that's Meshack. Vescovy can run it too. Yeah, I was um, going to say, I thought Vescovy ran Jamie, I guess, can. But anyways, stay up on them. Kind of just just not allow them to get the free reign. And then it, once it's in the half court, it, it's a lot of connect. And this is what I wanted to go to. I, it just popped in my head as soon as I said Dalton connect there is... Tennessee runs 
pin downs. Like they they are going to run pin down after pin down after pin down for Dalton Connect. And if it is working, they are going to keep running pin downs for Dalton Connect. And it's it's very I mean, I'll I'll throw it up really quick, I guess, on the board, but like it's very similar to kind of what MSU does for Tyson Walker. Um it is kind of the obviously Dalton Connect's a much bigger score in terms of like he's six seven and Tyson Walker's six one. But it's literally just and I'm only just going to show the offensive players here. Um you have connect here, right? He's here. And then you have a screener, a screener, and usually somebody like this. And it's literally, he can just come off of this way or he can come off of this way. And it's going to be pin down after pin down after pin down, right? And balls up here. Sometimes he'll flow off one and then they'll have this one go off this way. And Dawn, this, I mean, where Dawn connects so good is he can flare this out to the three, right? And just um, catch it out here, go up immediately. He also will curl this sometimes and get down to the rim. And this is where I think Edie can be really important is like, one of the ways to maybe try and stop this is you'll see at times and Purdue did it in the first game is you have the defender trail. And so they're trailing, right? This, this kind of whole way down something you can try to do. I don't know if Purdue will do is you have the defender play on top. And so this is called top locking. And so basically you're just trying to force Dolan connect to only go this way and not really be able to get that advantage going off the pin down. If you're doing that though, you're, you're more susceptible to kind of these, these back cuts, right. And, and getting these back cuts to the rim and that's where if Edie can kind of one-man zone, right, off of whoever he's guarding, whether it be either of these screeners and not really worry about what they're going to do offensively outside of eight feet, that's where you can have the the guards just force and really try to stay on the three-point line and not allow those, knowing that Edie can take care of anything there. And so Purdue hasn't been good at screen navigation for a large chunk of the season. It is one of the big things defensively that they're just – like they just aren't good. They have their moments, especially Jones and Heidi. And that's where um, if Jones and Heidi can have a, it's going to sound weird, but if like if Jones and Heidi can have a very good screen navigation game, that's going to be huge for Purdue. Um, but then that's also goes back to the Edie thing of just like being able to one man zone should be big. If, as long as, you know, Adu is not going nuts from three, but even then you saw it with EK, they just live with it in the long run and eventually the misses will come from three. Hopefully. Yeah. Yep. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully. Um, do we know, I, I mean, I wish I, I knew whether Isaiah Walker was listening or not. Cause I'm curious what the, what the, uh, referee pool was for, for this game. I, I hate to like, I hate to even talk about that topic. Cause we, I mean, Purdue fans don't like watching a foul fest either, but there's a good chance that there's a decent amount of fouls in this game because Tennessee fouls, they fouled the heck out of Purdue the last time around in this one. Um, I, just real curious who that official crew might be, um, whether a Courtney Green sighting is possible or not for that game. Uh, just as a guy who's uh, watched uh, enough Courtney Green <laughs> officiating, kind of interested in that. Yeah, I mean, and, and as, for anybody that doesn't know Isaiah Walker, um, I think it's at iWalker41 or something like that on Twitter. Um Go follow him. He does a great job refing. He's a Purdue fan, but also just in general, he he knows his stuff. And if I mean, I tweeted I tweeted at him yesterday during the game of like, hey, the 10 second count resets after a timeout, right? Like, he knows his stuff. Um, he also know who are good and bad refs. So, um, yeah, he'll be the guy that you can go to on Twitter, and he will definitely have those answers. Um, we're hitting the 30 minute mark. Only gonna go a few more minutes. Like I said. Is there anything kind of big picture you want to get to? Um, there, I know we have a few comment stars. We can get to those too, whatever works. Yeah, I mean, I think we covered most of the, <clears throat> I guess, the the key flash points uh, for this game in terms of what Purdue might be able to attack, what Tennessee is going to be able to do. We've also all seen it once already this year, so it's not, maybe not quite as much to dig into and wonder um, about what they might try to do as some of the other games. So I'm good with just hopping into the start. Comments, we do want to make sure we get over to the press conference and um, see what uh, Purdue coaches and players have to say. I'm also real interested, just because they've already played once, um, to hear a little bit from Rick Barnes and, and what his thoughts are about this rematch also and get some content out for you guys. Yeah. Um, we, can't you put video, we can't put video out on these NCAA tournament ones from the press conferences, so it'll, it'll just be the text copy. Of uh, any uh, quotes that we do here um, that we think is of value for you all. So I'm good hopping into some starred comments and just kind of bouncing yep. off of those questions to cover anything else we need to cover still. All right. Uh, from SJFCIZNS. So this, <laughs> do you think Morton gets any minutes as a defensive stopper for Connect? 
I think if that happens, that means Jones and Heidi are getting torched or in foul trouble. Those are kind of the two scenarios where it's just like, because I don't, I don't think Colvin, I mean, he might try Colvin on him for a few. It didn't go well in the first matchup, but also Colvin is a much better defender at this point. Um, then, yeah. I mean, that was, that was his, that was Colvin's fourth game. Like it was the fourth game and he had to go up against a you know, top two, three score in the entire country. Like that's just not going to go well for most freshmen. Um, but I would think I would think Morton just can he can maybe come in if there's foul trouble. Maybe you see him for a minute or two. It's just like a change of pace. But that's that's the kind of the extent to me. Yeah, and I I just look back. I didn't really Morton only played six minutes in that yeah. that first matchup. So I think they found some success. Now th that doesn't mean Connect may not play entirely different uh, the second time around, and he may have to try some different things. But um, you know they they kind of bottled Connect up when. You know, it's kind of like talking about Zach in terms of bottling him up. I think he still had 16 or 17 points in that game. Uh, but they slowed him down enough um, without necessarily having to go to Morton and be able to have some options out there that still have a little bit more offensive acumen on the court than what Morton does at this point in time in the game. Yep. No, and then from Jeff Parks, I mean, this is kind of the same thing. Who gets the connect defensive assignment, TKR or Lance? Um, I don't think TKR would. I assume it's just going to be Lance. Then, then it'll be Heidi from there is my guess. Um, moving on to from Sally Ammerman, please speak to the coaching matchup too. I mean, this is, these are whatever you think of Rick Barnes. Like he is a good coach. He has had a long career for a reason. We obviously know how Pam, Matt Painter is, right? And we think Matt Painter is one of the best. Um, these are going to be two coaches. Uh, Painter's never been to a final four. Barnes has never been to one at Tennessee. I think Oh three was the last yeah. time that he went to one. Um, I would, you know, I would, I would expect both. Like these are both going to be good coaches. It's going to be a high level game. Um, it, it really is. If you and and then I also think both are willing to make adjustments now. Like if Ed gets going, maybe Tennessee hard doubles, and, and then or if if Connect gets going, maybe you see Purdue even just showing more and more towards him and making others beat or just things like that. I, I fully expect it to be a well coached game. Yeah, I, and they're they're both great. Uh, like you said, Barnes did go to the Final Four in two thousand three. I just double checked that. Real quick, um, both of them have gotten a little heat at different times over the years for not advancing far enough, supposedly, in March compared to maybe what they were in, at Tennessee. You know, Barnes kind of got run out of Texas because he had some really, really high-level, high-talent players um, that maybe didn't have the success that that fan base and uh, administration thought he should have. Um, so both of them got a little bit of something to prove here, I think, in, in this particular game. For me, from an X's and O's standpoint, in terms of making adjustments, running certain sets to get Zach the ball um, with a better look, um, being able to just adjust from the offensive end to, to get, you know, whether it's getting Mason a look at the right time or um, free up Braden a little bit, I, I'm going to put that advantage to Painter personally. Um, I just think he's been pretty masterful in the way he's done that. And we need to give some credit to PJ Thompson on that too, because yeah. he's call, he's calling those plays uh, during the game in terms of just reading the situation and knowing what they need to go to. So credit to both of them, but I, I I'll give a slight edge to, to painter in this matchup from a coaching standpoint. There you go. Um, back from, from Sigiv, the sins again <laughs> how important is vescovy potentially being out of the game has the flu um vescovy isn't like i mean he's who's i don't know who the comp is but like he's a guy that maybe doesn't have as big of a role as he kind of used to um but he's a guy that knows the system he's gonna play solid defense he can facilitate the ball he can knock down a three um like i don't think it's you know, I don't, I don't know if it's like Vescovy's out, Tennessee can't win type thing. I don't think that at all. And I also don't think if he's in it also, it means that Tennessee like wins for sure. But I mean, that's a guy that plays, I don't know, what does he play? Probably like 30 ish minutes, 28 minutes a game, something like that. Um, and he's just, he's just a solid player for them. And anytime you have a solid player out that throws up off your rotation also in, with Purdue. And, and I know Vescovy's a guard, but like if foul trouble is a thing, that's, that's another body that you just don't have for fouls. Yeah, and he's a 39% career shooter from three and really, really high up on the leaderboard for Tennessee in terms of careers th career threes made. He's a secondary ball handler at times for Tennessee as well. So, um, you know, he's important, no doubt about it. But, you know, I guess like on our team, it'd be kind of like playing without Fletch, I guess is what I would say would be the closest thing. Yeah, fair enough. Um, from Andy Buck said, I remember Ants had 
so he's talking about Ant Wright. Um, I remember Ant Wright had some clips on Twitter breaking down Purdue's defense on Connect. I kind of vaguely remember those two. Um, definitely, yeah. I mean, I assume most people probably know who Ant Wright is, but uh, well, some people who listen to the show aren't on Twitter, so that's uh, true. That's that's primarily where Ant puts his content out. I think. Um, does he have a YouTube channel too, though, or does he just? He does, but I don't think he posts that much there. I gotcha. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty far back if you're going to look for it. So uh, somebody on the show who wants to spend way more time than me looking for that should go back and find it and retweet it and tag us in it. Well, if you, I mean, I, I can try. Because if you, I assume you know how to do this, but in case you don't, so you can like, in the tur- you know how to like, in the tur- Twitter search bar, right? You can do like at... It's Ant Wright, and then in quotes, Joe, with like Alden Connect. Joe, I'm 46, not 72. I know. I, how I was to making sure, <laughs> and then for other people, well, also for other people that that may not know, you can put okay. at it's Ant Wright, and then in quotes, Alden Connect, and then those tweets that say Connect will pop up. Um, from Michael Hogg says, "How can I find out about tickets for tomorrow at Mackey?" I'm gonna just throw this up there for kind of the chat to see for anybody that didn't. I don't know. There's me that some people are talking of a watch party at Mackey. It might be student only. It might not be. I would just, if you have questions, probably look into Purdue socials um, or Purdue website. They would probably be the ones to have the actual answers. Just wanted to throw that up there for that. I didn't start this one. Matthew Keller said, Joe, your feed the post is amazing. Keep it up. I appreciate that. Uh, for anybody that doesn't know, I've YouTube called feed the post. I have a Purdue Tennessee scouting reports and, Honestly, a lot of what we verbally talked about today, I kind of have in video form. So um, I would definitely appreciate you guys heading over there, checking it out. Um, appreciate all the support that you, you guys are giving us both here and for me on there as well. And then last thing, and we'll get out of here from Linda Jackson said, show some love and hit the like button. We would gen- genuinely appreciate that. Um, we're going to head over now to do quotes and just do, we want to do this little impromptu scouting report breakdown keys to the game all kind of mashed up in one talk some hoops and then we're going to go get some quotes watch some hoops later illinois plays uconn at right about six o'clock eastern time hopefully that is a good game um and then tomorrow 2 20 eastern time purdue purdue is one win away one win away from a final four um i do yep. uh, real quick because like I, I i i hope or not hope i think a lot of people have probably seen it but like Miles Colvin put up the Purdue advancing sticker and the Purdue yeah. locker room just didn't care at all. Yeah. I assume that they'll be a little more excited if they make the final four, but uh, we'll see. But either way, when the wins that that's all they need one win, you just go they're out a, there. They're hundred percent business right now. Yep. Yep. They have not hit their goal yet. Uh, making the elite eight, like I said last night when I kind of went on my rant um, <laughs> to Joe there or not Joe, but to Greg, um, Making the Elite Eight is a huge, huge deal, right? Um, Tennessee, is this their second time ever in the Elite Eight? Is that what I read? Something Maybe. like that. Um, doesn't happen all the time for a lot of programs. So, like, we should appreciate it. Team should appreciate it. But this this is not their goal. Um, they have a 100% business-focused mindset to get to the Final Four. And even when they, if they, if they win and even if they get there, I think they're going to approach going into the Final Four the exact same way. Um, hate to see Jamal Shedd get hurt in that game. Uh, but Houston going down like that, that opens some thing up, uh, when Purdue, if Purdue makes it to the final four for that first matchup, because Houston, Houston was the one I had starred in terms of being scared of. So got to get there though. Got to take care of Tennessee, which oh yeah, oh yeah, they will hopefully do tomorrow. Uh, Chihiro Yuki says it's students only. That's for the Mackey thing. So uh, they're student and, and said it was only for students. Just wanted to throw that out there. We appreciate everybody tuning in. We're going to get out of here, head over to Little Caesars Arena. Um, and then we will be live after the show. We need to talk about that a little bit because there's going to be like cutting the nets and stuff, I assume, if they win. So don't know exactly what time we'll be on after the game, but we will for sure be on after the game, hopefully after a Purdue win. We appreciate everybody tuning in. Follow us on Twitter at Boilers and Stands so that way you can get these uh, press conference updates, and then we will see you all tomorrow.